Is it time for the 49ers to bench cornerback Diameter Lenore? We're going to get into that and much more on tonight's mailbag edition of the Jack Hammer Show. Hey everybody, happy Monday. Welcome to the Jack Hammer Show, where tonight we are going to be going through your questions. It's the regular Monday edition of the Mailbag, uh, the Hammerhead Show. Not working out, as you know, uh, Rob was out in Las Vegas, and he's on a flight right now on his way back from Vegas to uh, home. So uh, Jack is flying solo. Best way to do it for, for me is to answer your questions. And there, I have a, a bunch of them that I got from Twitter earlier today. Uh, we'll go through those. We'll also go through some of the questions that you have uh, over in the comment section. So we'll go for about an hour or so. It should be a lot of fun tonight. Uh, try to keep this thing lively and moving. We have Lucas Pessy in the house. He's a member of the Toolbox. He says, hi, Jack. Hi, Lucas. Good to see you. Uh, we have uh, Texas Niner in here. We have uh, Ill Tones came in early to, to say no, that the Furniture should not bench Diameter Lenore. We have James Foster, who thinks that the 49ers should bench, uh, should bench Diameter uh, Texas Niner says, where, where are we at? Probably because I'm a little bit, little bit late. He says, why bench D, uh, Demo? Um, rough game yesterday, Texas Niner. That's the, that's the reasoning behind it is, uh, we live in a society where you're, what have you done for me lately? Uh, he had a bad performance yesterday against one of the best wide receivers in the league in Devonte Adams. So it's time now to, to bench Diamond Lenore, according to a, a number of folks, uh, KW2421 asked, do we have the depth to bench him? We'll get into that. Uh, so let's go through it. Let's get into it. Uh, as far as the show, want to have a bunch of things I want to talk about. But, you know, the Flyers had that big win yesterday, 37-34, uh, crazy game in Las Vegas, their ninth win in a row. It's the first time since 1997 that the Fort Niners have been able to win nine games straight. Uh, and you look at it, and yesterday's performance, the, the defense wasn't what we would normally expect. They had some rough patches for sure. They kind of overshadow, I think, what was uh, – some of the positives of what they did, you know, the 49ers during this nine game win streak have forced uh, nine turnovers on downs during this win streak, four of those coming inside their own 10 yard line. Yesterday we had one of those uh, the week before there was one as well. Uh, they have actually forced uh, four of those. Like I said, uh, three of them in the last three turnovers on downs in just the last two weeks. In addition to the turnovers on downs, which don't count as a regular turnover, if you look at turnover stats, it doesn't count as a turnover. But in addition to the turnovers on downs, they have four 17 turnovers in the last nine games. Yesterday, two more turnovers. One of those, the interception by Drake Jackson, turned into the game tying field goal to score the game at 24-24. The second turnover that they, they had from Tayshawn Gibson led to the game-winning field goal. So the 49ers defense yesterday, definitely some struggles, but there was also some really good pieces of this game as well. I think one thing, you know, going into it, if you, I know you guys all follow me here on the channel and we went through the, uh, the pregame thoughts on how this team is going to perform against, against uh, the Raiders. And I, I felt like it was really going to come down to what happened with the quarterback position, uh, Derek Carr being benched. So could Jared Stidham, was he going to be functional? What was he going to do? And I think in a lot of ways, we lost focus on some, some things about the Raiders that we shouldn't have uh, because of the quarterback position. We figured that was going to be bad. So from there, you know, the Fire's defense is going to just shut these guys down. Well, you look at the Raiders and they have Devonte Adams, one of the best wide receivers in the league. They have Darren Waller, one of the best receiving tight ends in the league. And then they have Josh Jacobs, who is one of the best running backs in the league. And then you top all that off with an offensive line, which is one of the best at protecting the quarterback in the league. The Raiders, I think, are now sixth in the NFL in terms of sacks, sack percentage allowed. So they are very good at protecting the passer. We talked about this last week and that with this 49ers defense, it is all about getting pressure on the quarterback. It is about hitting the quarterback, knocking him down, getting turnovers, getting sacks, 
And if they're not doing that, this defense is going to struggle. Well, guess what? Yesterday they went up against the team with an offensive line that for the most part played very well. Didn't really allow them to get to it. They, I, don't, I don't think there was a sack yesterday at all from the 49ers. Nick Bosa did have five quarterback hits. But there was signs going into this game that it would be a struggle just based on the matchup. This isn't a good matchup for the 49ers. When you have a team that can stick to the run the way that the Raiders did, and you have a team that has a tight end that can threaten that middle level like the Raiders do, and you have that wide receiver, it's tough. And yesterday, if you look at the way that game played out, it all it was a perfect storm of what could go wrong for the 49ers. So looking at that first question that I have, uh, I'll bring this up really quick. Let me get to it. The uh, I'm going to get into the uh, the play of Deometer Lenore first, and then we'll get into some of the injury updates as well uh, to, to make sure that we get those covered for you. Uh, just give me one second. Don't see the uh, the question that I was supposed to pull up, but uh, let me see. Let me get back to it. Um, I was wanted to get into the one about Diameter Lenore, but I don't think I copied that over into my my uh, my my headers. So we'll just go with this one. We have Nilo Theo. Uh, Nilo Nilo Theo comes in and he says, "Who's the better cornerback two option, Diameter Lenore or, or Juan Jen or?" Uh, Janoris Jenkins. So should we be going with Diameter Lenore or Janoris Jenkins? Uh, he also wants to know how number 99 played yesterday, meaning Javon Kinlaw, and why does it look like, why does it seem like Talon Hufanga gets burned for at least one touchdown every week? So let's get into all of this. There's, there's, this is a, a big one. Let's take it one little piece at a time. There's a number of folks that asked questions that were similar to this one uh, going, going forward. So Looking at the Diameter Lenore thing, it makes sense, right? You have Diameter Lenore struggling yesterday against Las Vegas. He allows a pass rating of 113.69, uh, five catches on five catches for 108 yards on seven targets. Definitely struggling against Devontae Adams and Darren Waller. However, if you go back and you look at what Diameter Lenore and Lenore has been doing since he moved to the outside cornerback position. He's been playing really strong. Now, let's even back that up. Let's just, let's just take that into even a smaller sample size. Over the last five weeks, for example, Diamelo Lenore has allowed a passer rating of just 57.78. So yesterday, a bad game, but the five games going into that, he was very strong. 57.78 is a very low passer rating, an average of only 5.4 yards per pass attempt into his coverage during that time. For the season, since getting moved from the slot out to the outside corner, Diameter Lenore going, has now, including yesterday's numbers, given up 31 receptions on 50 targets, 415 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. Now, the, the thing there, his passer rating, including yesterday's poor performance, when he plays on the outside for, for Diameter Lenore, is an 80. Tavarius Ward, who usually gets matched up in man coverage more often than not against the best wide receiver on the other side of the field, he's at 79. So it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, but Diamond Lenore, for the most part, has been playing very well this season at outside corner since that move. Now, yesterday he struggled. There's no doubt about it. Can't You just can't say that any other way. He struggled mightily against Devontae Adams. He struggled against Darren Waller as well. He had the pass, the holding call against him against Darren Waller on that one deep throw uh, or one play. There was a holding call. Uh, so it was a rough outing for him. He gave, again, five, set, five catches, uh, 108 yards. Not a good game. However, he has played at a fairly decent level throughout the year. And I'm not sure if it's time to make that change. You look at the, you look at it, and um, as just so happens, Kyle Shanahan was asked about this last week on Friday, and Kyle Shanahan said that the foreigners are set with Lenore as one of their starting cornerback cornerbacks, along with Traverius Ward, but that Jenkins could move into that lineup. Again, this is Kyle Shanahan. I think doing what he usually does, he leaves the doors open for for most things. If if he's not 100% sure that it's going to go one direction or another, he'll leave the door open, and he says that he could move into the lineup. Why would you do that as a head coach? 
that's the best way to create competition in practice. If a, if you if you say that it's going to be these two guys no matter what, and then you make a change, that looks bad upon you. And it also sends a bad message to the player that he doesn't have a chance to play. So they're going to do this most of the time. I don't I don't fault him for what he said there. I don't think that – I don't personally believe that Janoris Jenkins is going to be moving into the starting lineup this week. The 49ers already have used one of Jenkins' three activations up from the practice squad. They have two more remaining before they'd have to add him to the active roster full-time. If they make this move, it's probably going to be coming up during the playoffs. So I think we're still going to see Diamond Lenore starting this week. And then the other question, when you look at the Talano Hufanga piece of this, he's going to be the starter. Talano Hufanga is going to be the starting safety for the 49ers. There is not going to be a change there. He does give up some big plays, but he also comes up with a number of big ones as well. Just to kind of give you a reference with this 49ers safety group, tandem of Tayshawn Gibson and Talano Hufanga. Gibson and Hufanga have recorded seven interceptions this season. It just so happens that it is that th those seven interceptions is the most by a 49ers secondary duo since 2014 when uh, Antoine Bethea and Eric Reed had seven combined interceptions. So the 49ers are very solid on that back end. Uh, I know that they're going to give up some, there's going to be some mistakes. You're going to have those at times. Again, I think this was one of those where it's a matter of the matchups. I think going into this game, um, as I said earlier, I, I missed the whole thing with, um, <clears throat> I missed it with Jarrett Stidham as well. And some of the, the reasons that this could be a tough game. It was just, you know, my question was with Jarrett, my question was, is Jarrett Stidham even going to be a functional quarterback? We didn't know enough about him, and he was more than functional yesterday, throwing to some really, you know, good weapons. He had a, a good running game, and that running game, and the focus on the running game when you're playing against the young quarterback like, like Stidham, teams are going to, especially early on, are going to focus on getting up there and stopping the run, especially in a third and short situation. And so they go up over the top to Waller, who beats the coverage. And uh, that's that's a top of the 49. There's no doubt about it. That was a, that was an easy possession for the Raiders. They came out, Stidham to uh, Moreau for 20 on the first play of the game, off of play action, and then you have him uh, a little check down to Josh Jacobs off play action for 14, and then for the, the to Waller, I, you know, and uh, I understand that there is a group of folks who have been on Talon Hufanga for a long time. This isn't new. The A lot of the same people who were talking about how poorly uh, Talon Hufanga played yesterday were the, are the same ones who were talking about how the 49ers should not have Talon Hufanga as their starting safety before the season started. And so I, I think you followed me long enough to know that I, 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 uh, I don't have a problem with, with, Speaking what I think it is is going on, and and also saying things about uh, my opinion on, on why things are being said. And I think the uh, the Twitter piece of this with 49ers Twitter is Talon Hufanga was not a very highly thought of player to begin the season. All you have to do is go back to my my Twitter when I said that he was going to be the starter, and look at the responses that got. Well. People have or have a have a hard time with getting past um, their own thoughts as far as you know new information and really changing it. It's one of the reasons why we have people who uh, still continue to tell us that we need to get more information, more information on on uh, Brock Purdy. How Brock Purdy has this issue, that issue. These things are going to eventually come back to bite him. Well, he can win ten games in a row. When, when Brock Purdy struggles and they lose it, pay attention because those are the people that are going to be saying, "I told you so." Uh, even though it took nine, you know, ten wins before they were right, they'll come and they'll make sure that you, you know that they were right. So, um, as far as the the piece on uh, the question of this question with regards to Javon Kinlaw, you know, yesterday in in that performance yesterday, I thought that Javon Kinlaw was not anybody that we even noticed if he was on the field yesterday. There wasn't. Um, I didn't. It's hard for me to go into this and say that there was any kind of a takeaway with how Javon Kinlaw played yesterday. He played 22 snaps. 
And as far as yesterday's game goes, I didn't really see him uh, make a difference at all for the 49ers. Uh, he, in those 22 snaps, just uh, did not record a quarterback hit. There was nothing about his day yesterday that, that even shows up on the stat sheet. So uh, how Javon Kinlaw played yesterday, that's a tough one. Can't really answer that because uh, he didn't show up. So uh, the other thing on, on, on Javon Kinlaw is that I, I know that uh, somebody hit me up on Twitter to tell me that Dante Whitner, uh, 49ers, former 49ers safety, uh, said that he should he would be benched soon in re, in place of uh, Janoris Jenkins, and my response to that is, okay, uh, he he's a former defensive back. He's going to uh, know the nuances of that position better than I will, and he may be right. I don't think that he's you know again. I think that uh, Janoris Jenkins. There's a reason why they brought him in. And if they feel like he's going to give them the best opportunity to start, he will. I don't think that's going to happen this week. I think if we see Janoris Jenkins, that comes in the playoffs, unless there's somebody else that they're going to bench um, to get there. So hope that helps. And I haven't really been paying attention to the comment section. I'll have to get over there and, and, and check those out. But let me let me change the ban take this banner off really quick. And so that brings us up. Wanting to make sure that I get to uh, Travis uh, Zuschlag. He asked, he wanted some information on Dre Greenlaw. He wanted an, an update on that. So let's hit that Dre Greenlaw injury update really quick. And, and that, it's a quick one because there really isn't one. Uh, Kyle Shanahan today speaking with the media says that he, there, there is no information there. Uh, they have, he hasn't been able to get all that inform anything there at all. Uh, due to the holiday, all the machines aren't available until tomorrow. Uh, so they're going to find out then. They'll make their decisions from there. It doesn't seem like it was as bad as, as some – might have thought uh, in regards to Aaron Banks, another injury. Uh, he has an ankle knee sprain. He's likely to be out this week. Uh, and then they'll see how he is for next week. If the fires are playing in the uh, wild card round, they'll decide on at that point where uh, Aaron Banks is and his availability. And then they also have running back Christian McCaffrey, who uh, has a mild ankle sprain, wasn't reported during the game, didn't come up until afterwards. And uh, Christian McCaffrey is just like all of us. He is day to day. Uh, my my thought on 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 that is that we'll probably see uh, him miss practice or be limited on practice on Wednesday, uh, but then he'll be back on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so I don't expect to see anything major uh, with with him. I, I think if there was any issues, we would have seen that happen during the game. Uh, and then the other injury news for the 49ers is uh, the Debo Samuel and Elijah Mitchell. Debo Samuel is going to be out there continuing to practice this week. Elijah Mitchell, uh, he was activated on Friday, and he will be participating in practice as well. Uh, we'll get a chance to see how they, they, they go through preparations this week, and there is a possibility that they will play this week. Uh, and it just kind of depends, according to Kyle Shannon, on how they practice. Uh, and unfortunately, the weather out here in California is not very good right now. A lot of rain uh, taken, taking place out here, and uh, that is going to hinder the 49ers a little bit in their efforts to prepare this week. So I don't think we'll see some of these injured guys uh, maybe being able to practice quite as much just because of the rain. They're going to want to take it a little bit easy on them. So uh, that's that piece there. We have Luke Walsh in the house who says, hello, everyone. Will the New York Giants rest their starters versus Philly? It depends on um, what you want to believe. Their head coach was asked that question today. Uh, Brian Dable was asked that, and, and Brian Dable's response was that, no, do you have time to rest once the season is over with? And that's not going to be until uh, February 1st for some team, for two teams, the rest of the beginning of February. The rest of the teams will be off at some point earlier than that. But right now the Giants are in the middle of their, of their season. According to Brian Dable, he expects to start his – play his starters on uh, Sunday against Philadelphia, that game taking place at 1.25 p.m. in the afternoon, the same time as the 49ers. And that's a, a big game for the 49ers in terms of uh, playoffs. Now you look at where the 49ers are right now. And before I get there, I want to throw this up on the screen for Bryant. Culp. He says, hit that like button, everyone. This is something that I really struggle with. I need to get better at. So please do hit that like button. And let's get to it. Leaving before I move off of the D'Ambro Lenore discussion says, Womack slaughter outside rest of the season? No. Uh, 
we've seen Sam Womack play outside corner, right? We saw what happened when when Sam Womack went onto the came onto the field in place of of uh, Traverius Ward two weeks ago against uh, in the, against in the last game at home for the 49ers. Uh, we saw what happened in that game when they, against um, against Washington, right? I, I want to make sure we we all saw Sam Womack on and the and the Washington Commanders go right down the field, go right at him, and, and take advantage of him and, and score, right? I mean, we saw that I, I think, and, and we saw what happened with Sam Womack in Atlanta earlier in the season, right? When when uh, both Traveris Ward. Was out. Emmanuel Mosley out. Traveris Ward went down, and Sam Womack came in at outside corner. We saw what happened in that game. Uh, it wasn't pretty. So, uh, no, I don't think Sam Womack is going to be in the slot or uh, outside at all the rest of the season. I think I think the 49ers are, are pretty well set, and I don't foresee them making the wholesale changes that it would require to move somebody into the slot. Again, if you're if you're looking at this and you're, and you're saying, okay, let's move Jimmy. You know, Talano Fonga needs to come out. We need to take out uh, right now the way Fournier fans are bench Talon Hufanga, bench uh, Dominic Lenore, and let's go. I, I okay. So we're going to bench Talon Hufanga for the award. Okay. Now who plays in the slot? You don't want Dom, if you don't want Dominic Lenore to play outside corner, you definitely don't want to play. In the slot, when he was in the slot this year, he was awful. His numbers were not good. Uh, let me get those for you really quick, because they were not good when he wasn't. When Diamond, the Forty Nineers were winning those games, so it didn't look bad. But Diamond Lenore from the slot was uh, not good. It was uh, it was it was much worse than the outside cornerback stuff. So when Diamond Lenore played in the slot this season, let's go to his game against the Los Angeles Rams in week four, he gave up nine catches on 11 targets for 89 yards. The next week against Carolina in the slot, he gave up seven catches on eight targets for 102 yards. So in the slot, he gave up 191 yards in back in, in two weeks. He did not give up over hundred yards again. He had, he did not give up more than 53 yards all season long, once he moved to outside corner, the worst that was his worst total was two catches for 53 yards against New Orleans. I think one of those was the deep ball down the middle. But outside of that, he has been strong. He 20 yards against Atlanta, 48 against Kansas City, 43 against the Rams the next time around. Against the Chargers, he gave up eight yards. Against Arizona, he was targeted once, gave up no catches. Uh, New Orleans, the one I already mentioned. Against Miami, he gave up one catch on five targets, had an interception. He had uh, five of nine against Tampa Bay for 31 yards. So basically put it this way, other than the game against New Orleans, which he gave up the one big throw and the one deep the game yesterday, he had not allowed more than 48 yards in any game as an outside corner. So I think that it's important to just take a step back and not overreact to one performance. And it's really what it is, is it's it's one performance because outside of that one performance, he has been okay. I'm not going to say that he's been great because he hasn't been, but he's been good. And as Cash says right here, that's correct. Womack got torched by McLaurin. Correct. If Terry McLaurin was doing that to Sam, Sam Womack, what do you think a guy like Devontae Adams would have done to Sam Womack yesterday? Again, Devontae Adams and Sam and Diama Lenor, there's history there. We've already seen what De Devontae Adams can do to Sam Womack. That is not a good match, or excuse me, to Diama Lenor. It's not a good matchup for, for Lenore. Got to go back, take yourself back to week three last season at Levi Stadium. Lenore in um, late, gives up a couple of big throws. Uh, especially the one that leads to the, the game-winning field goal for the Green Bay Packers. So there was history there. And again, we should have gone into that game knowing that there was going to be some issues. And the whole reason why we didn't was because the thought was that Jarrett Stidham is going to be bad, and that's why we don't really have to pay attention to the rest of it. And I was wrong. 
and I think so were a lot of other folks. And when I when I go back to it with uh, with that, you know, it was all about the one question that I had going into that game was Jarrett Stidham, is he going to be functional? And one of the things that I wrote pregame was, well, none of us know about Jarrett Stidham. Well, the 49ers have very little film on Jarrett Stidham to know what he can do. That head coach for the Raiders, uh, Josh McDaniels, he knows exactly what this guy can do because they've been together for four years now. And in a lot of ways, the fact that it was Jarrett Stidham yesterday instead of Derek Carr made the Raiders better because all of a sudden now you had a quarterback that could move then and Stidham hurt the 49ers with, with his, with his legs. You look, remember the touchdown pass to, um, to Adams for 60 yards, breaks contain slides to his left, sits there. All of a sudden somebody breaks open, he hits him, and it's a touchdown. Take yourself back to week one. It's one of the things that I said about Justin Fields and why Justin Fields outplayed Trey Lance was that he made the plays that he needed to make to win that game. And part of the reason he made plays was because he was a threat with his with his legs. At that point, the 49ers were struggling with with uh, with Stidham and jumped a, jumped something that they shouldn't because he had escaped the pocket and he was a threat to run. And so that's broke down the coverage and he beat him. So again, there's a lot of things that go into it. And uh, I, I saw a lot of things yesterday that I disagree with in terms of this defense. I thought they played poorly at times, but when it mattered, when they, in the second half, they were much better. They were down by two scores. The 49ers defense did what he has. You are never going to come back from 10 points down in the NFL if your defense doesn't make stops. And not only did they make three stops in a row, one of those was an interception, which put the 49ers in field goal position that directly led to points. And then in the overtime period, made the play, scored the touchdown. And that's a lot of me talking about uh, – say about defensive back play, but I think it's important to, to discuss that. I think there's a lot of folks that want to know about that and what's going on there. Uh, Musley28 uh, asked, uh, please explain to me why Jordan Mason can't get more carries. I know 23 Christian McCaffrey is a heck of a back, but how good can McCaffrey be if he was fresh the whole game? Mason can make this running game lethal. Let me explain it to you why you're not seeing more of Jordan Mason because I agree that from a running perspective, Jordan Mason would be – him getting the ball more would be very beneficial to the 49ers. The reason that he's not getting it, they haven't said this, but there's a history of this with, with Kyle Shanahan in which he um, won't allow young players, especially at the running back position, to play regularly unless they show the understanding and ability to deal with the passing game in the NFL. That is the issue with Jordan Mason, I think. I don't think that I don't believe that they believe that Jordan Mason is ready as a in the passing game of their offense. And that is the reason why we aren't seeing him more. That is the reason why when they get back Elijah Mitchell, you're going to see some of, of Christian McCaffrey a little bit less because all of a sudden now Mitchell is a guy. Mitchell is a guy who brings that physicality and that ability to run between the tackles that you're kind of looking for from uh, from J.P. Mason. But the difference is that they trust what he can do in the passing game. They trust Elijah Mitchell as a pass protector. They trust Elijah Mitchell as a receiver. They don't trust Jordan Mason at this point as as a pass blocker or as a wide as a receiver in the in the uh, in the passing game. So that's why you're not seeing Jordan Mason. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's a very good running back, and I love watching him run the ball. That touchdown yesterday, awesome. Really nice run. Got off tackle, ran over the defensive back to get into the end zone. Uh, that was a thing of beauty. But that's why you're not seeing him. Is it's It goes back to the, the passing game uh, with, with him, and that's why we're not seeing more of him at this point. Uh, missed a super chat over here, so I want to pull that up. We have Sean. says, the commanders found kinks in the Friars' armor. The Raiders fully expose them. The cards game will be a critical test to see if D'Amico Ryans can make the right adjustments. The Cardinals don't have the threats that any of those teams do. The 
commanders aren't the ones that found the kinks in the four hours armor. The first team that showed this was the Atlanta Falcons. And what it is, is it's you, if you can commit to running the ball and then you have a quarterback, then make the throws off of play action. And you have weapons on the outside that can threaten the 49ers. You're going to be successful. And, the that's again this is why the Raiders game I feel like we if, if Derek Carr had been going into yesterday's game if Derek Carr was the starting quarterback the discussion would have been a lot more on how do you stop these weapons how do you stop Devontae Adams how do you stop Darren Waller how do you stop Josh Jacobs because there was a quarterback there that everybody would have felt that they could that could beat them but because Derek Carr wasn't there we stopped talking about it, and that's my fault for, for not talking about it more leading into the game. Is this is where the this what we saw yesterday is the perfect storm against this 49ers defense. A top flight cornerback, wide receiver, excuse me, a very good tight end that can take away, take make the, the middle of those guys in the middle really have to work. I'm talking about Fred Warner and, and Dre Greenlaw and those linebackers, and then a running back who can grind out yards and yesterday what we saw though by grinding out those yards the Raiders weren't in third and long all that often and when they were the Raiders have one of the better pass protecting units in the NFL and that's that's a big piece of this is the pass protection up front as well um that's going to pull up really quick just to kind of give you guys an idea so because that's one of my biggest things is I, I really net yards per pass attempt uh, I like to look at the percentages much more than I like to look at uh, just the, the, the numbers themselves because you can see a guy like, like for example, the four, the Las Vegas Raiders have a lot of a sack on 5.01% of their dropbacks. That is very good. And it gives – that's a problem for uh, the 49ers and for most teams. The 49ers are at 5.2. The reason I like to look at the percentages, though, is because instead of just the numbers themselves is because – the, the 49ers may be a little bit more of a run-heavy team than some other teams, so they're they might show fewer fewer sacks than others. But you start to look at the percentage of drawbacks, and it gives you a little bit better idea of what's going on. So, uh, you know, you look ahead for the 49ers. Who out there matches up with them in this in this way? Uh, Dallas, they are at 4.78. Tampa Bay at three. Tampa Bay is a little bit different because they have a quarterback that's not going to move. So you know where he's going to be. And the reason that Tom Brady usually beats teams is because he's able to get the ball out on time. The 49ers in that game earlier this season at Levi's did a really nice job of taking away those early routes, forcing him to hold the ball, and then he can't move. And so it makes it much easier for them to get to him. Um, so when you look ahead for the 49ers, the only team, there's two teams that are right around them that I, I would worry about. Dallas. And Green Bay, I, I understand Green Bay is is if Green you know Green Bay people are laughing about that because of Aaron Rodgers and the success the Fires had against him. If you're looking for a team that's going to that can give the 49ers fits, it is the Green Bay Packers. They have the running game, they have the receivers, they have a tight end, they have all the pieces. They have a quarterback that can move around. Green Bay when it is the one is the team to watch out for, I think, in round one, depending on how this thing plays out. Uh, there's that one. Thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. That was a good one. Uh, let's go to uh, the next the next question that came up. Um, Schlepp70, this, this will be a quick one. He says, it's reported the Raiders are looking to trade Derek Carr before the beginning of the new league year. Can the Friars do the same with Jimmy Garoppolo? Okay. So really quick, just so you understand the rules, the Raiders cannot trade Derek Carr officially before the start of the new year, new league year. The way that it's set up, the trade deadline is passed. So now that the trade deadline is passed, there are no trades that can become official until the start of the new league year. So what is being reported is that the Raiders want to trade Jimmy or Derek Carr, and they are going to try to get a deal in place prior to the new league year, but that deal will not become official until after. So I hope that makes sense. So can the Friars do the same thing with Jimmy? Yes, they can get a deal. Uh, you know, they can't, excuse me. No, they can't trade Jimmy Garoppolo because for the they're in the middle of a trade deadline right now. You can't trade him. 
Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be a free agent. So can the 49ers trade him? No. So there's the answer to that. I'm sorry. I misspoke right there at the beginning of that one. Uh, Daryl Kwok, are you worried about how Debo will be reintegrated back into the offense, which is humming without him? Uh, yes, there is a little bit of concern with that. And Mike, for, for, for me, uh, I, I think that right now the foreigners are in a pretty good rhythm on offense with what they have. Uh, the more uh, chefs you get in the kitchen, the tougher it can be at times for the offense to, to really get going. Uh, I, I felt like the the offense was slowing though pretty good uh, when he was there with Brock Purdy. It seemed like that offense was going pretty good against Miami. It looked like it was going pretty good against uh, Tampa Bay as well prior to the injury. Obviously, look at the points that were scored. So there's a concern there. But am I am I worried? I'm not. Getting, that's a, worried is too strong of a word. But I would be. I would agree that I am concerned about that. And that leads right into this question from. Uh, Fernando Guzman uh, at FGU 780 says, how scary will the offense be with Mitchell and Debo coming back for the playoffs? And do you expect rust for rust from them? Uh, I think the offense is going to be really good with these two guys. Elijah Mitchell in particular is a big piece of this because of what he can do as the second back and, and being able to give Christian McCaffrey a break. Uh, and then Debo Samuel can be moved all around the, form, the formation. He helps them out with that screen game. So those easy plays uh, at the, at the same time, look at what Ray, Ray Ray McLeod did yesterday, right? A little screen, the little he's lined up in the in he's not as the number one receiver closest to the, the sideline. He's number two, the second guy in. They run that little screen to him instead of the outside guy like they usually do. And he takes off and goes 40 plus yards on the screen to, to set up a, a, a score. So you're you're seeing Ray Ray McLeod get some explosive plays over these last couple of weeks. Uh getting Debo Samuel back though won't hurt them. And then in terms of the rust question, nah. Uh, look at what Elijah Mitchell did earlier this year. He missed uh, multiple. Uh, he he missed multiple weeks. I think seven games that he missed. And uh, you know, as far as the the seven games that he missed, he comes back from missing those. Goes uh, 89, uh, 18 carries of 89 yards in his first game back. So. Uh, there's that piece on it with Mitchell and Debo Samuel. And uh, looking at the comments section, it looks like there must have been uh, something that went on in the Monday night football game with uh, don't have it on, not watching that. But uh, there, it looks like there's a player that's down, not sure who it is. Um, and that looks like it's really bad. Uh, not sure who it is. Harold Morello says that uh, Bill's player made a tackle. After he stood up, he fainted, fell on his back. That They were giving CPR on the field. This is uh, scary stuff. So uh, they took him off in the ambulance. Uh, hopefully, uh, whatever happened there, uh, prayers up to the, the Bill's player. And uh, that's a really tough situation. That's, that's, that's rough. And I see some of the comments there. And, and yeah, there's... Uh, that's really bad stuff. So I'm not sure exactly what happened in that, but uh, prayers up to DeMar Hamlin and uh, the injury that, that he sustained there. Hopefully everything is uh, going to be okay with him. Uh, let's see, just kind of going back through where we were. Um, Cole Hartke had a question that was very similar to the Jimmy and Womack conversations we've talked about already. Uh, DJ Neal, 10, what, who is your best comp for Purdy's play style? Can, and can he sustain this level of performance, get even better cheers? Uh, my comp for, for Brock Purdy, I think it's tough to, uh, I think it's tough to have one, player in particular that you're copying him to. I would say he's uh, in size. He has the size and the arm of Drew Brees. Uh, he has the mobility. Uh, he has the mobility to uh, of I said at times of Joe Montana. I think the way that he slides around on, on some of the bootlegs and things like that uh, is... Uh, pretty fantastic. 
um, and, and that arm strength is 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 something that uh, yeah. I'm just sorry. I'm just taking a break for a second just to catch up on with you guys on Monday Night Football. But the uh, the game's been suspended right now. Um, not sure what happened there, and I know some of you are watching it. And uh, that is a tough deal. Um, looks like they're just suspending it, though, but they're not. They are not going to uh, officially end the game for right now. But uh, definitely looking at some of the pictures and the the the. Uh, but I can see that looks like a really bad situation out in, in Buffalo. So uh, tough deal and uh, don't know exactly what happened, like I said. And, and uh, I really hope that uh, everything is OK. And uh, we've seen players get carted off the field uh, with injuries that were non-life threatening. Uh, just thinking back to uh, Ryan Shazier, right? Again, in the game between the uh, the Bengals and the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, we saw him get taken off, and that game continued uh, after he left. Uh, so to to see them uh, take a player off the field and make this means that it was. Uh, pretty bad situation. So just kind of keeping an eye out and uh, trying to see what I see what else we can find going on here. I apologize. This is a little bit different stream than, than usual. Um, took that shot right to the chest just looking at it now I on Twitter I'm seeing it and uh, that's really scary that is really a bad situation so um, Yeah. That was a that's one of those one of those situations that uh uh I, I can't really speculate on it, but uh blows to the chest can be can be really bad, especially if it's uh depending on where if it hits it just right. And uh Hopefully everything is okay for for uh, Demar Hamlin because uh, that is uh, that is a rough one right there. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get back into this one a little bit. Uh, as I said, uh, yeah, I agree. I've never seen that CPR given on a football field before. Uh, and uh, only 24 years old and uh, prayers for uh, for Hamlin and his family as uh, Harold points out that's a that's a tough one um, yeah so I'm sorry guys just looking through really quick uh, Gizmo wants to know what happened or, or Sam and sandwich uh, what happened was it looks like, I don't know if it was a run or a pass out to the left side, and, and he came up to make the tackle. Um, the uh, runner was able to get up into him, uh, get his, looked like it was, it was a helmet to the to the chest area, and uh, like right in this, in this area, it looked like, and, and that's a bad situation. And he made the tackle. He got up, um, kind of took a step, and... Uh, and went down. So, uh, not sure exactly what what happened there, um, but that's 
that's pretty uh, pretty scary for the uh, for everybody involved. And it looks like right now the game has been postponed. For now, there doesn't look like there's going to be a decision uh, that's been made. Um, yeah, so let's let's go ahead and let's uh, let's get back to some uh, some some discussion on football. Uh, looks like it was a kick return. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you, Luke. Uh, thoughts and prayers go out to uh, to the player and his family, uh, also to everybody else involved too. Uh, everybody on that on that uh, field has a uh, something about this that that's gonna, they're going to carry with them. Um, so prayers out to to the player, his family, uh, everybody involved in this game tonight. Uh, hopefully everything turns out. Uh, uh, Levi says that uh, he's getting seen reports that he was uh, has a pulse uh, but not breathing on his own. Uh, that's a that's a tough deal. And uh, I see your comment there, Pete. And uh, yeah, that's I remember that very well. Um, with Dale Earnhardt. So let's get back to um, just answering some of your questions. So uh, Ellen Eliza says, Jack, what do you think about the uh, the Packers and the Lions getting the last Sunday night football game? I think it's a it's a it's a good move by the NFL from the standpoint of the uh, the playoff situation. Um, doesn't matter if Seattle winning all Seattle what Seattle if Seattle loses let me go back to my notes and I'll tell you exactly why this one makes sense um, for the seventh seed in the playoffs it's going to be Green Bay wins they're in if Green Bay wins Green Bay lose you know if Seattle wins they get in with a loss to uh, Green Bay or by, uh, by Green Bay. So a Seattle win means that uh, they are in if Detroit wins. If Seattle loses, if Seattle loses, then it comes down to the winner of Green Bay and Detroit having the opportunity to um, take that seventh seed. So that's actually one of the, the questions that I was asked. Um, today, let me get to it really quick. Uh, Chef Goat 24 asked what ha needs to happen to have the number one seed and who do we face if we are two and three? Uh, the number one seed is, is an easy one. The Farmers become the top seed in the NFC if they win and Philadelphia loses to the Giants. That happens. The Farmers get a week off and they are the number one seed in the NFC. If um, they are not, and the, but if the Farmers win on, on Sunday, they will be the number two seed. If the 49ers are the number two seed, they will take on one of those three teams that I mentioned. It would either be Green Bay, Detroit, or uh, Seattle in the first round. If they are the three seed, that one's simple. As a three, whoever the three seed is in the NFC playoffs is going to play against the New York Giant, uh, New York Giants. That one it will not change. Uh, so there's that piece there. Uh, so. Uh, How do I think? How do you think we stack up against Green Bay? I, again, I think that's one that, uh, if you're looking at potential playoff matches in round one, uh, 49ers as a two seed, Green Bay as a seven seed, uh, that's a scary one given uh, what Green Bay th can throw at the 49ers defense. Uh, I think that becomes a, a big question mark for the 49ers, one that you don't want to see. Uh, Harold wants to know: do, Does the 49ers secondary have a chance to shine in the playoffs, or does the secondary weakness too big? Uh, again, uh, the secondary could play strong. Just depends on they, they're going to need help from their from their pass rush. And when you look at uh, the teams that they could face, uh, I think they'd be in a pretty good position against everybody other than maybe Green Bay and Dallas. Uh, Detroit has been pretty good at protecting the quarterback as well. But 
uh, Jared Goff. I don't know if I if I believe in him enough. Uh, I think Tampa Bay. You know, we we've seen them be able to get after Tom Brady already. Uh, Tom Brady beats teams with his legs more than his uh, pass protection there, or excuse me, with his head because he gets the ball out so quick. Um, let's see what else we got rolling here. Uh, Uh, Harold says, I many blame Jimmy Garoppolo for the Super Bowl loss, but I blame the first secondary for the Super Bowl loss. As far as make it to the Super Bowl, the secondary needs to step up their game. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. It, going into a game against a guy like Patrick Mahomes, expecting that 24 points is going to win the Super Bowl for you, I think, or 20 points is going to win you the Super Bowl against a, a quarterback back like Patrick Mahomes. I think that's uh, part of the, the other issue. They only scored 20 points. And uh, he missed the throw that he needed to make. He missed some other plays that he that he needed to make to to move the, the sticks. Um, the secondary had their hand in it as well. It's a little bit of both. Um, but I think there's plenty to blame Jimmy Garoppolo on for that loss in the Super Bowl. Uh, I think there's plenty to of blame to be laid at the feet of the defensive backs on that one as well. Um, just looking through really quick. The last one that I'll take for tonight was from Jack T. Meyer. He says, what's the long-term impact of losing Aaron Banks? How does the O-line respond? I think this one is a, a really good example of the depth that the 49ers have created on this roster. Uh, they, you know, Having a guy like Daniel Brunskill, who started all 17 games for you last season, played almost every snap, uh, had was second on the team in, in offensive snaps last year to only Lake and Tomlinson. And he's your backup at right guard and left guard. That's that's tremendous for the 49ers. And so he steps into the starting lineup now at left guard. Um, yesterday he played well. Uh, once when his number was called upon, I think for the 49ers they just go into this thing and they just continue to roll when it, it went because of that. You know they just have so much depth there uh, with with uh, with Brunskill. Um, being able to step in and, and, and go. I, I think that's just a, another example, like I said, of the tr tremendous depth that the Farmers have created throughout their roster. We're seeing it again. That's the whole reason why we're even having the Janoris Jenkins discussion is here is a veteran just to kind of take this off of just the offensive line for a second. But the 49ers go not only 53 men deep, they go onto the practice squad with veterans that can be called up to play games for them. Uh, I don't know if there's another team in the NFL that has the depth throughout their, their roster. You look at the big play yesterday, one of the, the big stop down at the goal line, and that was Eric Armstead, who just made a tremendous play, um, shedding Colton Miller, mi missing the – being able to, to – he basically takes on Colton Miller, throws him inside. The fullback comes up. Armstead beats him, makes the tackle. And as he's making the tackle – uh, T.Y. McGill comes in and helps him bring him down. T.Y. McGill is a guy who was on the practice squad that they brought up, and he's been making big plays for their for their defensive line. And it's the same thing, I think, over here now with the Daniel Brunskill question is moving forward, Daniel Brunskill's the guy. And when Aaron Banks is ready to go, he'll step in. But it's a seamless transition because Brunskill has just played so many snaps, and it's, it really helps them out. So uh, there's that piece, and that is – the show. Uh, I'm gonna go check this out. I, I got. Uh, I want to make sure that. Uh, well, really quick, I did miss your super chat, the Buddha. Uh, let me get. Let me scroll up, and that was a little bit ago. Here it is. Boom. Sorry, the Buddha. Thank you for the heads up. He says, uh, in, in my opinion, nobody is going to replace uh, Diamond the North. Tight coverage, aggressive mindset, good tackling skills. Ambry Thomas this late in the season is too risky. I agree with you there. Uh, and I don't think anybody's suggesting really that it's Ambry Thomas. I know that I did see his name brought up at one point, uh, but no, it's not Ambry Thomas. If 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 you're going to be replacing Diamond Lenore, it's going to be with Janoris Jenkins, uh, veteran cornerback who played pretty well for Tennessee last year. Actually picked off Jimmy Garoppolo in that uh, game two days before Christmas Eve on that Thursday night game. Uh, Ambry Thomas wouldn't be the guy. I agree with you here, Debuda. I don't think – that it's going to be a replacement of Diamond Lenore. I think they continue to roll with them just like they did with Ambry Thomas. Uh, Diamond Lenore is no worse than Ambry Thomas was a season ago. Um, it's actually been better for the most part. 
and that's why he's been making the starts. So I'm with you, and thank you for uh, hitting me in the comment section to make sure that I didn't miss that. So thank you very much. I got to go make some dinner. I got a big thing planned. I'm going to be making, I'll, I'll be even follow me on Twitter. Get over to at Jack Hammer underscore NFL. I'm going to be making some chicken meatballs with polenta and, and some tomato sauce and all kinds of really good stuff. So if you guys want to see some good food, check out my Twitter in a little bit. I'll show you a picture when I get this thing done. Uh, it's a dish that I, I learned from uh, watching Food Network of all places. Uh, some really good stuff. So check that out. But before we leave, I want to say thanks to everybody that joined. You guys were, were fantastic. Thank you for uh, for being, uh, you, you know, the the issue out in Buffalo was a, a tough situation in that in that game between the, the Bills and the uh, Bengals. And I want to say thank you for the updates on that. And I want to say thank you for uh, the way that you handled that situation. I appreciate it. But if you guys, before you leave, can hit that subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. And I hit the little bell notification so you don't miss when we go live. And then last but not least, make sure you uh, hit that like button. The like button is what helps us grow. The, the more likes these shows get, the more it gets pushed out for other people to, to see. And, and uh, I really appreciate everybody who does that and everybody who watches. So thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your Monday. Take care, everybody. I'll be back tomorrow with the Hammer and Nail Show with Jesse Naylor. Until then, take care and keep it locked in here for all 49ers news and updates. Talk to you all soon.